Do you ever skip making predictions or just have your students make them before you read, but not during or even after? If that's you, it's okay. You're probably not alone. This little strategy can seem silly or not as important as other comprehension strategies. In fact, teaching your students to make predictions might seem like a basic thing they should already know. But do they? In this episode of the Teach Joyfully podcast, I'm making a case for teaching your students about making predictions. We'll talk about the how, the why, and great books to use as mentor texts for this important comprehension strategy. I'm Lisa Burns, a teacher success coach, veteran elementary teacher, and mom of five. And this is the Teach Joyfully podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Are you missing out? Team Hope Insiders get extra encouragement, tips and tricks, surprise freebies, and more. Become a Hope Insider today and get access to all kinds of freebies at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash vault. So let's get started. Why is making predictions so important? Sometimes making predictions doesn't seem like a very big deal, but it really is. When your students are busy making predictions, they're using evidence to support their answers, to make educated guesses about what is going to happen and how it will happen, who it will happen to, and where everything will take place. In addition, our students are learning how to check themselves and make adjustments to their thinking along the way as they read. And as they're doing this, they're learning how to make better predictions as well. This is so important for students to become flexible thinkers and to be able to change and grow and self-correct along the way as they're reading. This gives students an opportunity to revise how they're thinking So making predictions before and during their reading helps students self-correct and making predictions also helps students think and focus on the content. Let's face it, engagement in reading is worth its weight in gold. And one way we can help students become more engaged in their reading and to think deeper about their reading is by making predictions and learning how to revise them and check them along the way. Students will learn how to pay more close attention to details. They'll remember more of what they've read. And they also start to learn how to sort out what's most important and what is less important in the text that they're reading. So maybe the color of a character's dress is not that important to the overall story, but the actions of the character are. Students will learn how to sort that out and filter out what's not as important, and so that they can focus on what is important. This is a really important skill. And making predictions and checking on our predictions and making adjustments to our predictions helps students begin to learn how to do this. When your students are making predictions, they're also learning to think deeper, and that means making inferences. Making predictions is the precursor to inferencing, and quite often includes inferencing in our predictions, but we aren't always specifying that specifically to students, but they can learn how to do this in a very beginning way as they're learning to make predictions. Then when you're ready to really get dig deep into inferencing and really teach it in a much deeper way, and you can refer back to all of their efforts at making predictions when you start really digging deep into inferencing. So how do we teach this important strategy? Well, Obviously, you need to find a mentor text that lends itself to making predictions, which is really just about any text, not all of them, but a good portion of them. Then plan out your questioning before you teach. I love post-it notes. I put them all over books that I'm going to read to my students so that it reminds me of things I want to ask, I want to mention or draw attention to, or ask for their input on. These are all important things as we read, but it's easy to get caught up in the story or to forget what it was specifically that we wanted to draw attention to as we're reading. So having post-it notes already prepared and inside of the book really helps. Now I say that we need to make inferences before. I say we need to make predictions before, during, and after. 
Now, I say that we need to work on our predictions before, during, and after reading. So let's talk about before. Before reading, we are finding clues, and then we are making an overall prediction for the book. So when we're finding clues, we're looking at the title, we're looking at the cover images, and then we're looking at the first few pages of the book. I don't like doing a walk through the entire book most of the time, simply because it gives too much of the book away. And I want students to be able to make predictions throughout the story. So I try not to go too deep into a book with a picture walk when I'm doing a read aloud. Now, some books give you even more information in the pictures than others do. So an example would be The Mitten by Jan Brett. It is rich in those illustrations. And one of the things I really love about reading Jan Brett's books is it's such a great way for students to learn how to make predictions and to look at foreshadowing as they're reading. So what happens in Jan's books, if you're not familiar with her, she has images in the sidebars on each page. And those images show what happened previous and what is going to happen next. And so the left-hand page shows what has already happened and the right-hand page shows you what's coming up. It gives you a little hint. And this is so great for young children learning how to make predictions because it gives them a big boost. So not only can they use the words and the pictures, but they can use the pictures in the sidebars as well, which is really cool. Now, during reading, after you've gotten through the beginning, you've done have done the beginning of the book and made your predictions, we need to stop and think and check several times throughout the book to adjust and check our predictions. This is a really important strategy because it is training students to check their thinking and check their comprehension themselves. It is a training ground for this kind of a strategy for them to be able to use this throughout their reading lives. So we stop, we think, we check, and then we make any adjustments and make new predictions for more specific things that are going to be happening in the book, simply because we have more information now. We've read some of the text, we've looked deeper into the pictures, we have much more information on the character, the setting, all the events that have happened so far. Questions we can ask are, what do we know so far? Based on this, what do you think will happen next? Does this character need to make some decisions? What's this character's problem? What is happening? Were your predictions correct? And what do you think might happen next? The great thing about making predictions is it is the perfect place to teach students about using evidence to support their answers. And if you know me, you know I love teaching students how to use evidence to support their answers. I don't care if you're teaching kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, it doesn't matter. All these students can use evidence to support their answers and they love doing it. They love giving you their clues and their evidence that they have dug out of the story to explain why it is that they think what they think. So the last part is after the story. Why do I say you need to work on your predictions after the story? Well, first off, you need to check, right? So we need to go back and check. How did we do? How did, was my prediction correct for how the story was going to end? What adjustments can I make to my prediction? What actually happened? But then there's one more opportunity at the very end of the story to make a prediction, and that's what's next. What could happen next? Based on what's happened in this story, what could happen next? What might happen tomorrow to these characters or next week? What could a sequel be to this book? These are ways for students to make predictions and extend their thinking in yet one more way. It also provides great opportunities for writing. This is such a great opportunity for students to take those predictions and turn that into a story of their own. So 
as we're doing our checking of our predictions, our making of predictions and making new predictions, we need to provide students with plenty of opportunities to turn and talk, to draw their answer on a post-it, and simply provide ways for all students to participate. We don't want to limit students' thinking, and when we only give a few students an opportunity to answer, we are limiting all the other students' opportunities to dig deep, to pay attention, to really think, to find evidence, and to really learn this strategy. We have to create opportunities for all students to come up with answers and turn and talk opportunities, drawing their answers on post-it notes, making their predictions on a graphic organizer, whether they're writing words or drawing in pictures. Each of these are opportunities for all students to dig deep and really participate versus having a few students and everyone else defers to them and checks out. So make sure that you're giving every student an opportunity to participate fully in making predictions along the way. It is the only way that they will really learn how to do this. As we know, it's practice, practice, practice. And as much practice as we can give them, the better it will be. Okay, last piece is mentor text. You really can use so many books. If you love the book, and you know your students are going to enjoy it, you can use it for making predictions. Some books really lend themselves to this extremely well. So let me give you a list of a few, and I will actually have this list for you. You can download it. I'll put the link in the show notes so you can grab this list as well. This is not a complete list. As you know, I could go on and on about books. I tried to limit it to just a few. So This is a quick list to help you get started. I love The Mitten by Jan Brett, but any of the Jan Brett books will work. They all have those fabulous pictures and great sidebars for students at the very beginning level to learn how to predict. If you have older students, The River Ran Wild is a fabulous book by Lynn Cherry. Suddenly by Colin McNaughton is also a fabulous book. My Lucky Day by Kiko Kaza. What Do You Do With a Tale Like This by Stephen Jenkins? That is not a good idea by Mo Willems. Lost and Found, and I don't remember the author's name, but I will make sure I put it on the list for you when you download that. The Empty Pot by Demi. Folk tales like The Three Billy Goats Gruff or The Three Little Pigs. If your students haven't heard them, which so many students have not these days, Folk tales like these can be so valuable in learning how to make predictions. Tuesday by Chris Van Allsburg. Too Much Glue by Zach Retz and uh, Jason. I can't remember his last name, but I'll get that in there for you. Click Clack Moo and all the other books that go with it by Doreen Cronin are fabulous as well. Pigeon P.I. by Meg McLaren. They All Saw a Cat by Brendan Wenzel or Professional Crocodile by Giovanna Zamboli. Now, Professional Crocodile is a wordless book. Wordless books can be so valuable in this instance, so you might look into other wordless books as well. All right, a quick recap. Don't skip predicting. It helps students with learning how to use evidence, with inferencing, with focusing and self-checking their thinking, and really becoming active readers. Prep with questions and post-it notes so that you're ready to really help your students dig deep and find the evidence that they need to make great predictions. And don't forget using great books. A great book is one that you love, that you know your students will enjoy, and that is really all the requirements for a mentor text. There are certainly better options than others, but if you can pull out a book that you are absolutely in love with and you know your students are going to enjoy it, that is the most valuable book that you could possibly use then. All right, and that's it. Give it a go. All the links to resources mentioned in this episode will be in the show notes on my website at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash podcast. You can grab all my freebies at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash vault. And that link will be in the show notes as well. 
So that's it for this episode of the Teach Joyfully podcast, my teacher friends. My sincere thanks to you, my listeners, for tuning in and for all those of you who have taken the time to post a review or DM me on Instagram with your feedback and topic requests. You can find the show notes and all the resources mentioned in this episode on my website at www.hopeineducation.com forward slash podcast. And remember, a happy teacher is a good teacher. Until next time, teach joyfully and take care of you. Thank you.